It's very fair to say that as a camera operator, I have become completely converted to the Panasonic ecosystem. The EVA1 and GH5S are for me the ideal tools for corporate video production. So in this video, I'm going to explain why. It's taken me a long time to move away from my previous Canon cameras. I've owned the C100 since the end of 2015 and the 7D Mark II since 2014. And while I've used the FS7, the FS5, the C300 all on various shoots in the last five years, these are the two cameras that I have chosen to own. As much as the YouTube community would have you believe, Delivering in 4K is not yet the default standard for corporate video production, especially here in the UK, as I've found. The deliverable is 95% of the time still in HD. So because of this, I spent a long time umming and ahhing about whether or not I was going to make the switch to a 4K ecosystem. But as it turns out, there are a number of benefits to jumping up to a 4K ecosystem and delivering in 1080p. The Canon C100 was very hard to replace. Its image is still great for 2020 because of its 4K sensor that oversamples to a 1080p image. The C200 is just that 4K sensor again, but there is no oversampling. The Canon C200 had a number of drawbacks for me. One, its primary codec was an 8-bit 420 codec because a raw codec was completely impractical for corporate video production day to day, especially in terms of conferences and trade shows, completely impractical, but also the size of the C200. You can't break down the C200 quickly and you can't do it without tools. And for me, that was a big, big, big negative in its column and I didn't feel like that was going to be the camera for me because a lot of my shoots were moving from location to location to location very quickly. And a lot of the time you have to pack down and bag the gear back up again. And the C200 just wasn't going to be the ergonomical choice that I needed it to be. So to replace the Canon C100, my next camera would need to have these. It would need to match with my GH5S with minimal editing, record in 10-bit 422 in UHD and HD, both internally and externally, record to SD cards internally, be small enough to travel abroad within two bags, have two XLR audio ports, and be able to take all of my EF lenses without adapters. Fundamentally, the main reason for getting the Panasonic EVA1 was its image quality. Its image quality is fantastic. The Panasonic EVA1 is a workhorse. It can be scaled to do video production for corporate and commercial work predominantly, but there is no reason this camera could not do high-end narrative work. The Panasonic color science to me is as close to how my eye perceives color, and it is the look I've always strived to get out of my Canon cameras. Panasonic have done a brilliant job with their mirrorless lineup, and indeed they are workhorses in their own right. Both the EVA1 and GH5S interpret primary colours in an almost identical way in their log profile. And all you need to do is nudge the primary colours using a colour checker, and they line up perfectly. When you don't need the log profile, I found they match up very quickly using their own Rec. 709 profiles. I can't say it enough that the image quality from these two cameras is stunning. The EVA1 and GH5S allow up to 4K DCI recording in 10-bit 422 and then all the way down to HD in 1080p, with the exception of 4K 50 frames a second, which is in 8-bit 420. 
Both have the new HEVC codec, as well as H.264 in long-up or all-eye encoding. The EVA1 and GH5S allow me to keep the exact same workflow I've had with the C100 and the 7D Mark II. I can record smaller file sizes to the SD cards as a backup, and then record ProRes 422 externally on an Atomos device. I work with a number of different video production companies, and the number one request I get from them after the lighting and other paraphernalia I need to bring is that the footage I deliver to them has to be in ProRes 422. Now, the EVA1 only records in long up or all intra internally. So, using the Atomos devices, I can get a clean 10 bit 422 signal out of either the HDMI or SDI ports. And that was really important as I could do that in both 4K and HD. If I was going to go with the C200, I could only get 4K and 8 bit 42. Same with the FS5. So, being able to have all of the color information available that the EVA1 has and still have that in an external and an internal codec made the EVA1 again the obvious choice when it comes to deliverables for other video production companies. Both cameras record to SD cards. I don't have the V90 cards for the very reason that I let the Atomoses do most of the heavy lifting when it comes to footage capture. The long gop is just a backup unless I'm doing something over 100 frames a second, in which case I have to record internally. There is no slow motion without going through the 5.7k raw through the SDI, and I've personally got no need for that. Another of the main reasons why I hung on to the C100 for so long is its size. For a cinema camera, it's very small, but it's also easy to disassemble and pack down into a single roller bag, along with lenses, lavalier microphones, and an external recorder. This is exactly what I wanted the EVA1 to be, and it is. It packs down to fit into the same roller bag that I used to use the C100 for, and it packs down in the same amount of time without the worry of the top handle audio cable getting bent. On the EVA1, the XLR ports are on the body and it fits snugly into the bag. Even though the EVA1 is small and lightweight, it doesn't feel like a small and lightweight camera once assembled. It feels very much like using the Sony FS5 or the C100, and that was perfect for me. I'm a solo shooter predominantly, and I always have to be aware of sound. My main microphones are the Octava MK12, the Rode NTG1, and then I mix between the Sennheiser AVXs and the Rode Filmmaker Kit for lapel work. Panasonic did a great job with the preamps on the EVA and in making the XLR adapter for their mirrorless cameras. Because of this, I have two cameras that can record four microphones between them, both with mic or line level signals, and can provide phantom power to both ports. Probably the only bugbear with the audio when it comes to the EVA is the audio controls, apart from gain, are in a menu system. Whereas on the GH5S, they are physical switches. For me, it's that I have to make a mental note to make sure I don't plug in any microphone before first going into the menu to make sure that that's a mic signal and not a line signal, and that I'm not pushing phantom power when I don't need to be. It's a muscle memory thing, and I think after another month of solid use, it will be ingrained in my memory. It's here you'll charge for the actual cut and every motion graphic, animation, music you need to license, stock image, and everything else in between. It's here you'll charge for the actual cut and every motion graphic, animation, music you need to license, stock image, and everything else in between. The EVA1's EF mount can take most EF and EF lenses from Canon, Sigma, and Tamron. With the GH5S, I use a speed booster to again be able to use my EF lenses. Having two different sets of lenses to take around with me was just not practical.
both the EVA1 and the GH5S feature a dual ISO circuit, so they have two analog circuits for ISO performance. When you're shooting in the log profile, those are 800 and 2500 and 800 and 5000 ISO. It is here that I would say that the GH5S is the better performer consistently across its ISO range. It handles high ISO and color noise far more effectively than the EVA1 does. Now my results may skewer a little because I have a speed booster attached to the GH5S, which does let one stop more of light in than a standard Micro Four Thirds lens. 5000 ISO is about as high as I have ever taken a cinema camera. It is extremely rare for me to go any higher than that. Because of this, both cameras are equally suited to low light performance, but when I do need that better performance, I will lean on the GH5S more. The slow motion capabilities of the Panasonic EVA1 and GH5S are again very similar. The EVA1 can do up to 240 frames per second internally at HD, and the GH5S can do up to 180 frames per second internally at HD. The EVA1 has a slight advantage in that it uses a 10-bit 422 codec up to 100 frames a second, whereas the GH5S is limited to 8-bit Honestly, not that many faults with these cameras. The battery life on the GH5S could be better when using the XLR adapter. You get about 70 minutes on a full battery. The common problem with the EVA1 is the LCD screen, and yes, it is dreadful to use outside. When shooting indoors, it is usable so that you can shoot with it just fine, but outside, even with a courtesy flag, it's not good. It's basically a mirror. Secuto so make an EVF for it, which looks like it works really well. For the time being, I've been using a Hoodman HD450, and that does what the LCD cover that comes with the EVA1 can't do, and that is to cut light from above and below. It's not perfect, but what it does mean is that you can shoot outdoors and use the LCD panel for anything more than just the home screen control panel, although that's really what it's been designed to do. So what has been the point of this video where I talk about the EVA1 and the GH5S and why they work for me in corporate video production? Because that's a very specific market they work in, and I think they work in that market very well. They have a near identical color science, which means that when I'm in editing, I don't have to do very much to get the two cameras to match perfectly, and they do. And with that extra color information with the 10-bit 422 in both of them, again, I have the flexibility to be able to do this. For the longest time, I thought that the ideal combination for me was going to be the Canon C200 and the EOS R, which would be the step up naturally from my C100 and the 7D Mark II. Now with the EVA1 and the GH5S, I can do that. I can match them together, and I can match them very easily to the FS7, the FS5, to the C300, because I have that extra color information available. It doesn't matter that they've got different color sciences, now I have all of the color information I need to match them together. They're both small, so I can fit them into a single roller bag and travel all around the world with them. I can have four microphones plugged in at any time because I've got a little XLR adapter. 
there are so many reasons why these two cameras work. They're virtually big brother and little brother to one another. And I think that is the most important thing if you're working in corporate video production is that you have two cameras that just work. And they're two cameras which I enjoy using. Both have their benefits, both have their drawbacks, but they both produce a fantastic image at the end of the day. And that is the sole reason why you should have two cameras that match perfectly is that the image quality and indeed the, the, the reason you should have them for corporate video is that the image you get out of them is fantastic. Me, 2020, EVA1 and GH5S are for me perfect cameras for corporate video production. So thanks for watching. If you've got any questions about either of the cameras, anything I've touched on, pop it down in the comments below and I will see you in the next one.